Three billion, two dollars and fifty cents, one hundred million. Three billion, two dollars and fifty cents, one hundred million. Roughly half of the world, three hundred, three billion people live on two dollars and fifty cents a day. But there's estimated a hundred million children who live on the streets in the world. Many of the, them in the poorest urban centers across our world, incredibly vulnerable to all kinds of abuse, to all kinds of crime, to sexual exploitation, often with zero civil or economic support. I have four children of mine. I cannot even imagine young children fending for themselves, living on the streets, especially in some of these urban metropolises. Three billion, two dollars and fifty cents, one hundred million. That is their impossible situation. Today we're going to hear the story of a dear friend from Grace Church who this was his impossible situation. From when he was born to eight and a half years old, he was a street kid on the streets of Bogota, Colombia. And he's going to share with us courageously about how God brought him out of an impossible situation. And God, that's what God does. You see, the scriptures are full of real people, stories of real people who God came into their impossible situation and did amazing works in them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So welcome, y'all. 11 o'clock, how y'all doing? <laughs> right on. Well, my name is Jesse. I'm the campus pastor. Delight to have every one of you. I love our church. Love what God is doing. There's so many ways that God is moving. It's awesome. And if you are new, I hope you feel like you can belong here. Just be a part of this community and this family of imperfect people that we just create this safe environment that God, we want God to change us and transform us. Uh, online campus, Facebook Live, all the ways that people join us online, welcome as well. We have an amazing online community, and so glad you're uh, joining us as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book, book of Judges today. When's the last time you read through the book of Judges? <laughs> so Judges chapter 6 and 7, if you need a Bible, our awesome ushers are going to come on down. Feel free to use an iPhone, iPad. Um, but you're going to need a Bible to follow along. And if you want the house Bible, again, Judges 6 and 7, just raise your hand, page 117 in the house Bible. This is the, we're going to be looking at the story of Gideon and how God overcame an impossible situation for the life of Gideon. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray, unless you're getting a Bible. That's cool. You can keep your eyes open. <laughs> Father God, um, Thank you that you are with us. Jesus, thank you that you have been touching lives uh, all morning and, 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 and are, will continue. God, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to um, open up our hearts. Lord, soften our hearts. I pray for a good soil of our hearts to be able to hear and to understand, to perceive you, Lord. Lord, my, the eyes of our minds just be opened and Lord, we all come in with different places. Some of us very skeptical of this whole experience of, of Jesus and the Bible. But Lord, no matter where we're coming, God, you, you want to meet with us and commune with us. And so Lord, I pray for anyone, especially who's going to identify with John's story, that this feels like they are on that edge, on that, on that cliff, God. I pray that you would speak specifically to them and, and that they would just sense your presence, giving them a second chance, Lord, and giving them hope. God, I pray that that would be real. Lord, save us from our lives. Lord, help us move forward into this great adventure with you, into the impossible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we all have a story to tell. Every story is important, but some people have these stories that just seem bigger, you know, larger than life and grandiose, and many of those stories are found in the Bible as well. But it's through the less known, the, the, the less prominent stories, that seem, the ones that seem easy to dismiss, that we can actually extract so much meaning and significance and, from. And, and we're going to be doing that in this series, Extraordinary, looking at four semi-ordinary people that accomplish extraordinary things with God. 
Have you faced what seemed like an impossible situation? For me, I have many that God has uh, done in my life. But one in particular is that I wasn't supposed to graduate high school. I was a high school dropout. Yes, your pastor. <laughs> well, uh, wasn't supposed to gradu- uh, finish senior English. I was flunking. Miss Flicker, by her grace, allowed me to turn in an essay and pass so I could walk a few days before. And then I'd go into community college, Orange Coast College in Orange County. And same situation, just really poor student. And then I get busted and I have to take a semester off to go. You've heard the story if you've been to Grace for a while. My story had to go to jail and then rehab. But then I started going back to school after God got a hold of my heart. And that first semester back got straight A's, full load. Yes, isn't that awesome? I had never gotten straight A's in my entire life, even in like kindergarten when it's easy. And it wasn't just a one-time fluke. It was like semester after semester after semester. I got a couple B's thrown in there, but like just crushing the grades. I believe that God did a work of healing in my brain and just did a, over, an impossible thing to me and for, to those that knew me throughout high school, God was able to do. What about you? Is it with financial situation? Is it with your health? Is it, man people in your family that you want to see come to know the Lord? Is it this, you know, victory over sin? Maybe your kids and just watching them just feels like so impossible to, to see happen what you want. Have you experienced God's deliverance? Have you experienced God's deliverance? I love that image of deliverance where God delivers us like a UPS driver or whatever, like takes us from one place and puts us into another. Uh, the Psalms tell us that God takes us from the miry pit and sets us upon a firm, a solid rock, a firm foundation. This is what God delights to do. This is what God is in the business of doing, of delivering us, of overcoming impossible situations because of who he is in our lives. This is the story of one of my dearest friends, one of the the greatest leaders at this church. He takes care of my kids. He takes care of your kids, if you have kids in the kids program. He's our kids director. His name's John Liu. Check out the screens. There are approximately 5 million children that live in poverty or on the streets of the South American country of Colombia. These Colombian children are oftentimes victims of sexual exploitation that includes child pornography, sexual abuse, and sadistic violence. Being born in Bogota, Colombia in 1991, I was one of these children. Some of my first memories as a child was just not having enough food to eat on a daily basis and not even having a bed or a room that I could call my own to sleep in. The worst part of my childhood was between the ages of six and eight and a half. I unfortunately was a victim of sex trafficking. As you can imagine, life was terrible. And it came to a point in my life when I was eight years old, I clearly remember being at the most terrible point of my life. I was able to get on the roof of this five-story building and I was at the edge of this roof looking down and I knew that if I jumped, I would die. I wanted to die. Up to that point, I had had zero knowledge of God or Jesus or the Bible or church. But I remember looking up to heaven that very day and just asking the question, is this all there is to life? At eight years old, I had zero understanding that God was going to take me out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. I was adopted right before my ninth birthday and was brought to America to become part of a beautiful Christian family that taught me about God. My healing from my past was not an easy thing, and I thought it was impossible. I thought I was never going to be able to do it. But what we think that is impossible, God actually sees as possible. And for me, doing the impossible was actually allowing God through me to see lives change because I was willing to allow my story to not be something that would define my present and my future, but would actually give hope to those that also had their own impossible situations. 
My name is John Lee. I'm no longer a victim of my past. I am determined to be a proclaimer of hope to those who need God to do the impossible in their lives. Don't you love that guy? Love that guy. What's up, Jay? <laughs> love that guy. And that brother is on a mission. He loves people well. Um, and that is the story of John's impossible situation. And there is much more to the story. Do you know the story of Gideon? The story of his impossible situation. The story of Gideon takes place in the book of Judges. And I want to give you a little background to, to Gideon. See, in this time, the Israelites, we'll just say they weren't doing so hot in their relationship with God. In Judges chapter 17, verse 6, this kind of sums up where they're at with God. It says, in, the days, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is like everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. It's like original sin. It's kind of this sense of, I get to do whatever. I want to do whatever the heck I want. And I don't want anyone to tell me what to do. I don't, especially God wants to tell me what to do. And that, let me tell you, is a recipe for a hot mess, for all kinds of dysfunction and brokenness, isn't it? You get to a point in your life and you come to realize, yeah, that actually is what that does. And, and so why is there abuse and sex trafficking and so much darkness in our world? It's because it's when people are doing what is right in their own eyes rather than what God is calling them to do. So the time of Judges is roughly between 1380 and 1050 BC, around 300 years. See, the people of Israel were led by Joshua and Caleb. Remember that last week? It, it, to the promised land. And then they wandered for 40 years. And then, they, and then they got into the land of Canaan. And then they began to settle there and take out all the, the enemies. And then before there was kings in Israel, God appointed judges to lead, literally judges to lead the people of Israel. So Gideon is the fifth judge about 12th century BC. And I want to summarize Gideon's story in particular. So it, it says in, in Judges 6 and 7 that Israel was doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so because of that evil, God al allowed them to suffer for seven years. And how they suffered is the Midianites, this another group of people came in and every time it was agrarian people, farmers. And so whenever they would work so hard I've never farmed, but it looks hard. And, and when, the fi when, the, when, the, when the harvest is finally ready, they would just come on in and take all the harvest. And, then, and they were stronger and there was more of them. And so the Israelites, there's nothing they could do. How devastating. And it says in the text that they were brought low and they began to cry out to God. So get, uh, God decides that he's going to raise up a judge to lead the people of Israel out of this situation. So Gideon it comes into the story and he is threshing wheat. What the heck is that? He's beating wheat basically and like kind of separating the, the stuff from the stuff or whatever. And he's hiding it from, <laughs> that's very technical, very technical. I did go to seminary. Uh, and, it, and he's hiding it in um, the wine press and he's hiding and, and, and to feed his family. And so an angel shows up, an angel of the Lord, and says, Gideon, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, you're right, I am a mighty warrior. No, that's not how he responds. He responds and says, I am the weakest in my clan, and I am the least in my family. You see, that is how I see myself. I, he is a young boy. As we get into this story, that is who this is. This small, the least, the most insignificant in his community. And God says, the, the angel of the Lord says, you are going to lead the armies of Israel to defeat the Midianites. And so you'll see this pattern begin to develop is that he says, all right, well, if it's true, show me a sign, God. I want to test you. And so the angel of the Lord's like, all right, check this out. He gets a bunch, he gets this food on a piece of wood and then poof, the food just kind of goes up in smoke. And he's like, all right, the, the Lord is with me. And so he's like, what do you want me to do? So his first task is to take out the, the idol of Baal, his father's altar. And he's afraid to do it. And so he does it at night. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So he takes out the altar. 
And then later on, he's like, all right, let's take, let's, I'm going to lead the army to go take out the Midianites. But before, God, I just want one more time for you to know, to know that you're with me. So he does this, he, he puts a fleece out. Have you heard that? Yeah. yeah, he puts a fleece out to test God, to say, one last time, God, are you with me? Are you with me? And have you really called me to this? And so the fleece works out, and they start getting ready for battle, and Gideon's still afraid because God takes the 32,000 uh, Israelites down to 300 against the 135,000 Midianites. Those are not good odds. And so God says, all right, I know you're afraid. Go into the Midian ar- Midianite army and go listen to what they're all talking about. And essentially Gideon overhears these two soldiers saying, all right, I'm gonna take, Gideon's going to take them all out. And so Gideon gets, this, gets what he needs from the Lord, and they go and they attack him and fight him and win, and it's a, that's the end of the story. That is Gideon's impossible situation in a nutshell. And we're going to pull out three points from his story. Your, this is the main idea, the big point for today. Your impossible situation may be more about what God wants to do through you than what God wants to do for you. Because you may be thinking about your impossible situation and be thinking, man, if I just won the lottery, that would solve my impossible situation. God, if you could just change that person, my boss, you know, my, that loved one, or fill in the blank, that would solve my problem, my impossible situation. Done. You see, it's not about God doing something for you. It's about the work that God wants to do in you and through you in the midst of the circumstance that you're in. That's the big idea for today. So point number one that we're going to pull from Gideon is that it is okay to be imperfect, fearful people. Ain't that good news? We're going to get into this a little more, but that's good news because this is Gideon. He had real rational fears of the Midianites. It uses the word devour, that the Midianites would come and just devour the lands leave them with nothing. And they were just powerless to do anything about it for seven years. Can we say that he was historically conditioned? Historically conditioned to have fear about the Midians, to feel powerless, to feel like they're just going to do whatever they want and there's nothing you can do about it. You see, John Liu was historically conditioned, socialized, something like that, for eight and a half years to have to be vulnerable, to um, be unwanted, to be unloved, to let that adults that should be protecting him are taking advantage of him, to have n- not healthy attachments in his life, hungry. That is how John was historically conditioned. Your However you were historically conditioned, your story of pain and trauma, it's real. It's real, and it is, it is hard. And it's okay to be fearful and imperfect. Welcome to a bunch of imperfect, fearful people. The question is, what do you do with your story? What do you do with the fear What do you do with those memories that feel like they define who you are? What do you do with those things? Check out how Gideon dealt with his fear in verse 27. So Gideon took the 10 men of his servants and and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, (laughs) he goes ahead and does it by night. Isn't that cool that God chose to put these details in in the story. Aren't you grateful that God chose to put these details in the story of Gideon and all of the different people you look at throughout the story of Scripture? That these are just normal, everyday people that deal with fears and are human, just like you and I. But did did his fear stop him from doing what the Lord wanted him to do? He still tore down that altar. He just did it with his fear in the middle of the night. I asked John what fears he had to overcome, and he listed three. The first fear, he said, was his fear that the people that had hurt him, uh, the the fear that the people from his past would come back and hurt him. 
When I, I've, you've heard, you heard the two-minute version. I've heard multiple times the hour-long version and been in tears. And the people literally brainwashed him to believe that if he shared this with anybody, that they would hurt him even worse. So he had to overcome those fears. Incredibly traumatic. He had, he, second fear is that how people would react that found out about my past, he says. You know, because he got adopted in, in, into an incredible family in Texas, but, you know, he could start all over again. And he, and he was afraid of if they knew what would happen, that his third fear about being known as the guy that was sex trafficked, that he would just be labeled as a victim. So he says, so identity issues where my past would somehow define my present and my future. It was easier to not talk about it or let anyone know about it so that I could become something else or be whoever I wanted to be. And John Liu and his new life became very successful, crazy successful. But for years, in all of that success, he kept much of the story and much of the pain, trauma, hidden and buried. You see, God is patient with your faith process. Check out God's patience with Gideon. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if you grew up in church, this is like a classic, right? In elementary school, like the flannel graph, this is classic. If you're new to church, this, this is a good story to know. Anyway, so if there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he, woke, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. Just the fleece is sopping wet, the rest of the ground around it, super bone dry. And so Gideon's like, boom, all right, I gave you some specifics, God. You answered in specifics. I believe you, I'm ready to go. Is that how he answered? No. That's not how he answers. You guys, you guys know the story, I like it. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only this time and on all the ground let there be dew. So the opposite. And God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and all the ground there was dew. You enter into this moment of Gideon. Do you resonate with Gideon? Can you sense the fear? Can you sense the wrestling with believing that he is a mighty warrior, that he actually is going to lead the people, even though he doesn't feel like it and he wants to believe, but he's so paralyzed by his fear. The second point is that God is patient with our faith process. Gideon had his doubts. He tested God. And in, De in Deuteronomy, it specifically says, do not put God to the test. But Gideon over and over again is testing God and is God patience with Gideon in his fears. And even, even though he's doing what he's not supposed to, to be doing and he should just be walking by faith, Gideon is showing, thirdly, delayed obedience. John Liu actually wrote this sermon. And I was going to say this at the end, but I'm going to say it now. John Liu is actually going to preach this sermon tonight uh, on his own and tell his own story so you can come back and see it at 6 p.m. But he wrote this sermon and he said, delayed obedience is still disobedience, according to him, which I agree because I got little children and I do the whole one, two, three counting thing, you know, and by the time I get to three, they better obey. And if they don't, there's going to be consequences and they know it. One of the things that drives me nuts, well, I need to be kind and gracious, but one of the things that, you know, when I hear a parent count to three, and then the child doesn't, doesn't obey. And then they do what? They start over at one, <laughs> two, three. And she's like, okay, that's getting you nowhere. That, that delayed obedience is still disobedience. And this is, and, and, and so as a parent, you know, my job is to correct and to discipline and to teach my kids, but, but also to have forgiveness that knows no ends. To have radical acceptance for my four kids, no matter what. Like, I hold this tension as I parent my kids, as God parents me, and as, as God parents you. You see, however you are struggling in your life, God is incredibly patient with you. But there gets a point in your life where you 
have to stop playing the victim card. You have to stop playing the victim card. I understand that there have been things done to you that are painful. I understand that it seems like this world is, is not in your favor. But you ha- if you continue to play the victim card, it will be your identity. And it will keep you stuck in your, in your life. If anybody, if anybody has the right to play the victim card, it's John Liu. That dude has experienced more pain and trauma than probably the majority of people in this room. And that brother is, has experienced incredible healing and God moving through his life in impossible situations because he chooses to not play that card, even though he could. I asked John to expand on his healing process. He says, my healing process was letting go of those fears. Overcoming the constant mindset that something was wrong with me. Seeing various counselors resulted in them telling me that there was something wrong with me. Dr. Katzen was my final counselor, was the person to tell me that there was nothing wrong with me. That it was possible for me to let go of my past. That my past did not have to define my present or my future. But that my faith process required me, it required me to stop doubting God, demanding certain things from him, delaying my ability to talk about my past and bring it to the light. And is he bringing it to the light? Allowing God to use my story in the lives of others, not being controlled by my fears, my anxiety, my hurt, but turning that into trust and openness, being vulnerable, he says, adopting a new purpose and passion in my life, which was to let go from the victim mentality to the survivor, to a proclaimer of hope to others who could relate or be impacted or inspired by my story. Now that is a different mindset. That is someone who is choosing not to be identified or defined by his past, but by God and what God wants to do through his life. The third point is that God does the impossible, not us. You see, Gideon had 32,000 men opposed to 135,000 men. That is not good odds. And God said, that's too many, Gideon. I need you to whittle it down. And so um, it says, oh yeah, hold on. So So then he whittles it down to 300. That's 450 Midianites to one Israelite. Think of yourself surrounded by 450 people. That's not good odds. That is an impossible situation. Why did God choose to put Gideon in that vulnerable, impossible situation? God says it right here in in verse 2. The people who with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Why does God not want to whittle it down to 300? He doesn't want his people to say, I'm the one that did it. So should we say that we are the ones that did it? We re- no, that's right, man. Anyone else? No. Let's learn this lesson. We want, we want to say, God's the one that did it, not me. That, this is the lesson God wants to teach us. Uh, now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return to his home. Hurry. So, so Gideon says, all right, 32,000. Whoever's afraid, you can leave. No shame, no negative vibes, roll. 10,000, leave. And then God's like, it's still too many, 22,000. So what I want you to do, Gideon, is take all of them, and I picture a lake because that's a lot of people, and whoever drinks the water like this and get cups it in their hand and like laps it, that's who is going to be in. And everyone else who just like puts their head in the water, they're out. So 300 people pick up the water and drink like that. And God's like, Boom, perfect. 300, that's what we're doing this with. And in verse 7, God says, And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Who is going to save you? Not you, Gideon. Not you. We cannot save ourselves. It is God. God wants himself, he wants you to know if you're going to be saved, it's going to be him. And he puts us in these situations to let us know that it's going to be him that saves us if we trust him. If you are a child of God, God 
wants to save you. That may sound confusing. Yes, if you are a child of God, God has saved you from eternity apart from him. Hallelujah. That's more than we could ever deserve, right? Yes, amen. But God wants to do even more. He wants to save you from these old experiences that have taken power over you. He wants to set you free from them. He wants to save you from those things that drive you and I to all kinds of dysfunctional behaviors that bring us to that edge and that cliff that God wants to, to release us and to take the weight off of us. Do you need to be delivered from God, from that, from the pit of despair, from the tunnel of darkness, from the edge of the cliff? He may be asking you to let go of something. And I, I just want to invite all of us, every person to close your eyes right now. And just say, Lord, God, what do you want me to give over to you? God, what do you want, it, what past experience that's defining me? Show me, God, that you want me to give to you that you died for me to take. God, what fear is holding me back? Lord, show me. Lord, is there a person in my life, a relationship that I keep going back to, God, that you want me just to give over to you? Maybe there's a relationship that I need to reconcile. Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to, me to give to you? Spirit, I pray that you would do the work right now in our hearts to, to illuminate, to reveal. You can open your eyes. Your impossible situation may be more about what God wants to do through you than what he wants to do for you. John was saved by God's amazing grace from sex, being a sex trafficking victim. Are we going to label him as that? No, he courageously shared his story with all y'all. We ain't going to label him, are we? No. And the same thing is true for each one of us. That that is a part, sure, of our story, but that is not the most important part. That is not the core central part. That the, mo the, the best is, is still yet to come when we allow Jesus to take it and for us to, to even say, this is part of my story, but God, I can even share it in the right environment so that you can be glorified through it. It no longer has to have power over me. I no longer have to be ashamed of it. And if someone wants to shame me for it, I don't even care. Because I'm forgiven. And you, it, 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 God, that's not who you say that I am. It doesn't even matter what other people think. In March 2009, John, for the first time, he was in Mexico at an orphanage and shared his story publicly to a bunch of orphan boys. And he was able, who had experienced similar things that he had experienced. And it was another step in John's life of God allowing that pain and that, that atrocity to not define him, but for God to use it to bring hope and purpose and to those young boys that God can do that in their lives as well. And then he went to the Philippines like year after year and started a, an organization called I Testify. And, he, and, he, and, he, and the ministry was to gather young children, street kids, and to share with them the hope and the truth and the power of God. Erwin McManus is an author and pastor. He says, you need to decide what path of greatness you will choose. What will be the code of your life? The moment you choose to serve him, God can trust you with power. It may be that our powerlessness is a reflection of our lack of servanthood. Because God cannot trust power to a person who do, does not choose to serve. But when you choose to serve God, God can trust you with all the power that he has. I want to be the kind of person God can trust with power to set humanity free. And I don't know if you know John Liu, but that dude does not play the victim card. He plays the, I'm going to serve you and and make you feel like you are the most important thing. It's not about me. It's about what God wants to do through me. And as I step back and I notice, 
I notice the, the power of God and who that, that, that power flows through. It is the servants, isn't it? It is the servants of God that, his, that, that channels through their life, that they get to, to experience this, no longer a victim, no longer defined by those experiences, but by God. And the, letting those experiences give glory to God and be this trophy of God's grace to shine. What's your impossible situation? As we close, I, I want to speak to a few of you. If you just relate with John, just sensing that your life is, is on that edge right now. And I know that we all come here looking good. Y'all look good. But I know that inside, there are many that, that feel like, man, I'm, I just feel like I'm on the edge, and I want to pray for you. I know that there's others who feel stuck, trapped, because of things that have happened in the past, and not knowing what to do with those, and defining who you are that God does not want to define any longer in your life. And I want to pray for you. And then there's others that are just inspired by John's story, and you're like, I want, to, I want my heart and my life to be more about the things of God. I want to, I'm inspired by Gideon and his incredible leadership and fearful stepping forward, and I want to be more like Gideon. I want to pray for you too. Why don't we bow our heads? Father God, I pray for anyone who is on that edge. And God, they feel like you are so far from them. And maybe they've never known you. Maybe they've never understood that you love them, God. Or maybe they know it, but it just has not, pen you have not penetrated their heart, God. For whatever reason, their heart has just been closed to you, Lord. I pray that they just would, would I know, I pray that they would know it intellectually, but that right now, Holy Spirit, they would just sense your arms just coming around them picking them up off of that ledge, that fearful, vulnerable, hopeless place, God, and putting them into, setting them down upon you, God, upon your rock, that they could lay down in peace and rest with you, Lord. I pray, God, for anyone in that place, that they would just sense your, uh, your presence, giving them a second chance and a new reason for living, God. I pray for anyone those traumatic experiences from the past, Lord. They're done letting those things define them. God, they are sick and tired of being, of those memories haunting them, God. They're, they're, they're sick and tired of letting those, those people that have done those things to them or the, the things that they've done have power over them, God. And they're, they, choose, they're, they want to exchange that with you, God. And they want to, to give that and offer that to you. Jesus, take it from me. God, I receive from you your identity, your truth over my life. God, I pray for anyone who wants to have this fearful but moving forward kind of faith like Gideon that wants to lead and wants to influence and wants to be a mighty warrior for you, God that you would just stir that in their hearts, God, and they would, they would say, yes, God, today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.